thanking God for our blessings. Come thou found of every blessing. You know, this third verse, though, is so, is so much like all of us. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Come thy found of every blessing. Hope everyone is doing well. Um, let me give you, I think, just one announcement. Don't forget that this coming Saturday, the ladies are cooking a meal, and uh, they will give those out. You can drive by and get them. I think some of the seniors were going to deliver. And so if you uh, would like to be a part of that or, or uh, help with that or... Um, uh, want a meal or, or need, know of someone who wants a meal... Please be sure and, and respond to the email that was sent out or send a message on Facebook or call the church office uh, so that we know how many meals to prepare for. So, uh, and that's for this Saturday, this Saturday. Now, but you need to let them know by Thursday evening, by Thursday evening so that they can get all their numbers together. Let them know by Thursday evening if you want a meal or not, okay? And so, uh, okay, and I think that's all we have for this week. Um, as far as announcements go, and uh, let's get right into prayer requests. Um, I have a few uh, or a couple new ones uh, to give you. Um, remember, um, this is Danielle Davis's sister, Crystal. Uh, she was scheduled to have a surgery and went in for some pre-op uh, things to do and, and ended up having some complications and had, had to be put in the hospital. I was in ICU for a little bit. And they've got her back regulated, and, and, uh, but uh, she's still supposed to have her surgery tomorrow. So as long as everything is good and they've got everything fixed, she's supposed to have her surgery tomorrow. So remember her in prayer. And again, having some physical complications uh, even beforehand. So remember her. Um, and then also, uh, Ronnie told me tonight that Miss Sue Mae Mason, this is uh, Stacy Lucas's grandmother, who just recently had a surgery, and uh, you know that she had cancer, a tumor, and that kind of thing, and uh, she's not doing very well. And, and they've actually called the family in and uh, don't don't expect her to make it. So uh, so remember this family, uh, Sue Mae Mason, and. Uh, and I think, well, the ones that were given this past week, uh, the one that Angela gave me, uh, Mark Bennett, who was a co-worker who was in a wreck and broke some bones, uh, John Udy, um, a husband of a co-worker having some health problems, and also the Sandra Miller family. 
And uh, so let's remember these as well. All right, what other ones need to be mentioned tonight? Say that again. Uh huh. Okay. Is this a friend or a family? Cousin. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, this is Mr. Reed. He's getting moved to a, a rehab facility, so that's an answer to prayer. So we, we praise the Lord for that. All right, anything else? Okay, I'm sure probably many people have some unspoken requests. All right, well, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Kevin, hadn't picked on you in a while, have I? Okay, uh, you want to come up and lead us in a word of prayer, please? Father, I thank you for the good week that you've blessed us with. I thank you for allowing us to come back out to learn more about you. I pray that you'll be with us now as we bring these names before you. You know each and every need, and I just pray that you'll reach down and touch and heal according to your will. And I just pray that you'll be with the family members. I pray that you'll give them strength and wisdom on how they can help their loved ones. I pray that you'll just give them strength to be there for them as they support them. And I just pray that you'll bring healing to them if it be your will. And I just pray that you'll take this time to draw them close to you. And for those that don't know you, I just pray that you'll, you'll let this be what draws them to you and, and that they'll seek you, Father. And I just thank you for everything that you do for each and every day. And I just pray that you'll forgive us of our sins and shortcomings. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right, let's take our Bibles tonight and go back to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to look at one more character in regards to faith. Hebrews 11, we're going to begin in verse 5 and 6. We're going to talk about Enoch tonight. Interesting character, not a, not a whole lot of scripture given on him. If you have your Bibles open to Hebrews 11, if you can find that, I also want you to turn over to Genesis chapter 5, and we're going to look at the story uh, of his life, and it's encompassed just in a few verses there in Genesis chapter 5 as well. So I'll give you a few minutes to, to, get, to find those places, Je Hebrews 11 and, uh, and Genesis chapter 5. And, uh, and I hope that if you've been following with us, you understand uh, the whole purpose for the book of Hebrews is to present the Lord Jesus Christ and how he is the better way. Uh, we've looked at the priesthood, the priests, the sacrifices, and how he's so much better than all of that. We've looked at the Old Covenant and the New Covenant and how Jesus Christ is, the, is, is basically, because of him, is the New, is the new Covenant. And, uh, and, and how that is so much better than the Old Covenant with the Judaistic uh, uh, ways and, and the rituals and, and all those kind of things. And, um, and, uh, and the Old Testament, the Old Covenant... It had become basically a system of works where you got to check things off the list to be able to uh, get that done and, and making sure that uh, you're following the rules, how you're supposed to follow them. And, uh, and, and there was some truth in all of that, um, but it had become to where it was not so much by faith. And he's giving us this passage in chapter 11 of Hebrews uh, and letting them know that it has always been, the way to God, to draw near to God, has always been through faith. It has never been any other way. It's always been through faith. Uh, but the Judaistic system at this particular time had become something other than that. And so this is nothing new. Faith is nothing new. And we've gone through this and looked at some of this. We've Even in, in chapter 10, verse 38, the just shall live by faith. That's a quote from the book of Habakkuk. And uh, remember how he's tied in the Old Testament uh, in with the New Testament because the Jews, uh, the Israelites always adhered uh, to the Old Testament. All right, that, that was what they considered the law. Even today, you have some Jewish people who would reject the New Testament and hold on to the Old Testament. And, uh, and so as we look at this, and the author of Hebrews, this is what he's doing. He's bringing all these Old Testament verses and, and, and into this New Testament atmosphere and into the New Covenant to let them know that, look, this New Covenant was promised. This New Covenant was what God had ordained from the beginning. This New Covenant w was just a fulfillment of what God had planned. And, and it has always been by faith. 
And so as we, in our faith in Jesus Christ, is what, uh, is what he's reiterating here, how he's built his case about Jesus being better and Jesus being uh, so much better, the new covenant being so much better, it, because it accomplished, the new covenant would, could, could accomplish what the old covenant could not. And that is, in part, uh, drawing near to God. In the old covenant, you could not. It was the high priest to go in. Uh, but but in, the, in the new covenant... We can all, with boldness, enter into the throne room of God and find grace to help in time of need. And, uh, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ makes that possible. And so all of this is by faith. And we looked last week at Abel. We looked at the faith of Abel, and, and he brought a sacrifice. I hope that you remember that. We looked at that, and uh, he brought a sacrifice, and this had to do with his worship. This had to do with salvation, the way that he believed the Lord in that sacrifice. He, he obeyed the Lord. He believed in the Lord, and uh, he followed the Lord. And, and so he had acceptance with God through his faith in that sacrifice, and again, he drew near to God. And so that has to do somewhat with salvation and worship. And then as we get tonight, as we go into the Enoch, it's not worship so much as it is walk, walking by faith. And so let's look in verse number 5 of Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now, verse 6 ties in with, with Enoch here. Let's look at verse 6 as well. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, again, these tie together because verse number 5, the end of it, his testimony is that he pleased God. And then verse 6, it says, without faith it is impossible to please God. So we understand that, that Enoch had a life of faith. Now, let's go back to Genesis now. In Genesis chapter 5, Verse number 21, this particular chapter deals with Adam's descendants. And it goes through and it gives uh, Cain and Abel and, and Seth and, and so on and so forth. And it gets on down uh, to verse number 21. And it says, And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begot Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begot Methuselah three hundred years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And so, again, we see his walk there, his walk with God. So we're, we're going to go back and forth a little bit between Genesis and between Hebrews here as we look at the life of Enoch and his faith. Now, remember, the Bible tells us that, well, before we can ever begin our walk with the Lord, I hope that we all understand this. I think most of us sitting here do. Before we ever begin our walk with the Lord, the first thing that has to happen is sin has to be dealt with in our life. And that's what we looked at with Abel. Uh, Cain, he brought, he brought a sacrifice that was not acceptable, and therefore he retained his sin and went off, and, and we talked about this being the first false religion. And he could not draw nigh to God because of his sin, but Abel could. And now we're going to the next step of faith, and, uh, and, and, and Enoch has gone through that. He has offered this one-time thing uh, for, for, for his life, for the year, for, for salvation, all right, that we look at, uh, this redemption, this sacrifice. But now we're moving beyond that, and we're talking about not just a one-time salvation, we're talking about his walk of life and, uh, and how this is an everyday thing. All right, so he had to first of all deal with sin, and then the next step is to walk with him. Uh, it has to happen in that order. You can't walk with the Lord if you've never had your sins forgiven. Does that make sense? I mean, you can't do that. I mean, because God cannot, he will not have fellowship with sin. He just will not. And uh, as a matter of fact, it, the Bible tells us that your sins have separated you from your God. And so sin has to be dealt with. So we understand if he's going to have a walk with God, the first thing is his sin had to be dealt with. All right, so I just want to look at his walk, his walk of faith tonight, just for a few minutes. And, uh, and look in verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. All right, so that tells us that if he pleased God, then what did he have? Verse 5, it says that he pleased God. 
Verse 6, it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So what does that tell us about Enoch? That, that he lived a life of faith. His walk was a, life, a walk of faith. All right, so, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So the first thing that we see here is his faith had to do with who God was, that God existed, that God is. Now, Again, this gets a little deeper than just is God really out there, but there's so much evidence that we have around us. You know, it is not that I am, I, you know, some people, Jewish people would say, well, I'm a Jew, and I am from God's chosen people, and therefore I have favor with God. But that has no bearing on your approach to God. You understand that? We have all approach God the same way, and that is by grace through faith. And uh, as a matter of fact, our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We go through the Lord Jesus Christ to get to God the Father. And <clears throat> so you're not going to get to God by just being a Jew. You're not going to get to God by just uh, fulfilling rituals or religion. You're not going to get to God by just doing good deeds, uh, giving money, going to church. You're not going get, to get to God doing any of those things. It requires faith. So believing that God is now let's look at faith for a moment in God is. We have what is around us, creation. Uh, and, and if you go all the way back, we were talking, I think, a little bit about this earlier before church, some of us. But if you go all the way back, you know, you can try to analyze the things that we have and people come up with different interpretations of, of the evidence that is before them. You know, it doesn't matter if, if it says there's a flood, they're going to come up with other kind of, some other kind of explanation to, to disprove what God has said. I mean, they're, they're just going to do that. And then, uh, you know, they've come up with, with uh, evolution because they're going to try to disprove everything that God said. That, that's the whole premise behind all of those man-made concoctions and man-made theories. But you can't get past the point of getting all the way back to creation and saying, all right, well, what began everything? What was the cause of everything? And, you know, they can't, they can't tell you because nobody knows, nobody was there. And it only makes sense to say that God created things. It really, that's the only thing that makes logical sense. Uh, so, so you have the cause, and then also you can look around you and you have design. You know, we have, we have planets, suns, moons, stars, and they're all, you know, out there in the galaxy, and they're spinning around everywhere, and, and, you know, there's, there's rhyme and reason to them. I mean, they had their trajectories. It's not just arbitrarily thrown and flung up into space and just happened. You can just look at what's going on uh, in, our, in our solar system and know that there is someone out there, something out there that designed and created those things and put them exactly where they're supposed to be to orbit and, and to do exactly uh, what it's supposed to do, what it has been doing since the beginning of creation. And, and you can look at those things and determine those things. I mean, just our, our earth here. You know, the seasons that we have. Do you realize how it, it just it, it turns on its axis and it spin, it's spinning, it turns on its axis, axis uh, I'm, not, I'm not a scientist, and I'll get tongue-tied to all those X's and S's in there, all right? But, uh, and it's spinning around, and, and, and it moves, it tilts a little bit away, and, and we have winter. It tilts a little forward, we have summer. And we have in between, you know, uh, spring and summer, uh, uh, spring and fall, excuse me, uh, in between those times. We have tides. But that, that's affected by the moon's gravity. If the moon was further away, we wouldn't, you know, we would be inundated. If it was closer, we would, you know, th there would be so many problems that, that would arise just from the tidal. So around us, you can look at, I heard one guy, uh, he was talking about DNA. You know, it, 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 it's just like if I, if I were to take this book and, and just if I, if I had a million pages with a million letters, and millions of words, and, and, and all this, and we just fling them all together, and then it just happens to come down into a book, and it's arranged in all of these eloquent words, and you can read them. Now, how much sense does that make? All right, but then you take DNA, and DNA is a record of all, everything that makes you up. All right, are you with me? It, it's a record, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's information. That's what it is about, about everything about you, your hair or lack thereof. 
your, your eye color, your, your skin tones. I mean, everything is in that DNA. Everything is there. Now, what does that tell you? That just, that just happenstance. It just happened that way. It just developed over billions and billions of years. Really? Or there is, there is a, an author and a designer who has put all these things together. And all things live and breathe and consist because of his power and because of the way that he's, he's designed it. And, uh, and then also we have a conscience. I, I've given you a few things here. We have cause, we have design, we have conscience. Now, when I say conscience, the conscience that there is a God, if you go to the deepest, darkest jungles of South America or Africa or wherever you want to go, and you find a tribe that has had no contact with outside civilization at all, guess what they're going to be doing? They're going to be worshiping something. Whether it be a totem pole, whether it be a rock, whether it be a tree, whether it be the sun, they're going to be worshiping something. Why? It's because imprinted on the heart of man is something that is there to let us know that there is a God. It's there. It's in our conscience. It's in our very fibers of our being. And so you must believe that God is but it doesn't stop there. Now let's look again in, in verse number eleven, uh, chapter eleven, verse number six. Believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So this is again tied with Enoch. He believed God was. He also was a, a diligently seeker of the Lord. Not just that there's a God in heaven. Not just that there's a designer. Not just that there's a creator. But you can have fellowship and personal contact and a relationship with the God of heaven. You can seek him, and you can know him. And uh, this is personal. You know, this is reiter reiterated throughout Scripture. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to use my phone tonight. Instead of me turning to all these different things, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read them. If you want to write these down, uh, or, or if you want to get them for me later, that's fine too. But I'm, I'm going to write that, read, read you a few of them in First Chronicles. Uh, let me find it here. Where's my verses at? First Chronicles 28, verse 9. This is uh, David speaking with Solomon. And he tells him this. He says, And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father. How do you know him? How do you know God? You seek him. You find him. And thou, Solomon, my son, know that thou God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and a willing mind, for the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Take heed now, for the Lord hath chosen thee to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. What is David telling him here? He's saying to seek the Lord, to find the Lord. Seek him. Seek him. Psalm 119, uh, this is another uh, psalm of David. Psalm 119, verse number 10. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Now, we have David now. He's a man after God's own heart. All right, this is, this is his title, a man after God's own heart. But if he's a, God, a man after God's own heart, what is he doing? He's seeking. But he's seeking how? With his whole heart, with everything that he is. Not only that, but let's look in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. What happens when we seek the Lord? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. He's talking about food and shelter and clothing, all those kind of things. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and God's going to take care of it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Now, let me just say, in seeking the Lord, we have to seek the Lord on his own terms through Jesus Christ. Now, we have already gone through. Now, remember, he has already established how the approach into the presence of the Lord. Remember, we talked about the veil being rent into the Holy of Holies. Remember that? We talked about the veil being rent and the way being opened. And who opened that way for us? Who was, the, who was the great high priest? Jesus Christ was the great high priest. He ushered, he, 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 the, the temple veil was torn. He brought in the blood sacrifice that was good for all time, for all eternity, for every man. He opened the way and the way was open now that we could have fellowship with God. 
And, uh, and, and so we have to come to God and draw near to God on His terms. And His terms means through Jesus Christ. How do we seek God the Father? How do we get to God the Father? How do we approach the presence of God? That is by faith through Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Okay. So we, we have to believe that God is. This, is. this is the life of walking by faith with Enoch. Believing that He is and seeking Him now let's go back to Genesis chapter 5 for a moment. And Enoch, verse 21, lived 60 and 5 years and begot Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begot Methuselah 300 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years and Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. Now twice it's mentioned, verse 22, and Enoch walked with God. Verse 24, and Enoch walked with God. Two times it's mentioned there. So we're going to talk about his, his walk. Now what does the walk mean? And I think even this really encompasses in chapter 11 of Hebrews uh, the life of, of Enoch. But his walk, this has to do with not just you know, walking to the store or walking to the neighbors. This has to do with his lifestyle or his daily path uh, or his daily conduct. And the way that he lived was continually in the presence of God. Do you understand what I mean by that? Like he was, he was always aware of God's presence with him. This was his walk. His mindset was fixed on the Lord as his da- in his daily walk. His heart was fixed on the Lord in his daily walk, everywhere that he went. Now, Amos chapter 3, verse number 3, it says, How can two uh, walk together except they be agreed? So what does that tell us about a walk that Enoch had? And we're using that verse there. How can two walk together except they be agreed? What does that mean? That means if Enoch was walking with God, there was an agreement that had to come to, come to pass at some point, right? Well, guess what? God doesn't change. So who do you think changed in order to, to be in agreement with God? It wasn't they made a deal or anything like that. It was that Enoch decided, he said, you know what, God is right. And I'm going to walk in his ways, and I'm going to have fellowship with him, and I'm going to be reconciled to him. And, uh, and uh, he conformed to God's standards. He agreed with God's way. He did all of that. Uh, in contrast to this, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. Let me get to it. All right, this I say, therefore... And testify in the Lord that henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. This is talking about the walk of a man without the Lord. All right? A walk with a man without the Lord. So this is the opposite, if you would, of Enoch's walk. So let's look at this for a moment. In the vanity of their mind, the selfishness, having their understanding darkened, that's being in ignorance, being alienated from the life of God through ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. They're blind. Who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. And this is given over a lifestyle given over to ungodliness and wickedness. That's basically what the life of the flesh is. That's basically what the life of an unsaved person is. In contrast to that, we have Enoch's walk. And Enoch's walk was that that was reconciled to God, was in agreement with God, was not contrary to God. And, and so he was reconciled. He was made right with God. His walk reflected that. Now, not only that, but, you know, when you're walking with someone, what happens, you know, most of the time you walk with people who have the same interest as you do. Does that make sense? That means the people that you like, those are the people you hang around. Or the people you don't like, those are the people you avoid. So if you, uh, you have things in common, you know, I, I mean, th- this is one of the first things I do. When I meet someone, uh, a new person that I've never ma- met, I try to find out where we have common ground. You know, wh- where do we have common ground? Where do you work? You know, wh- wh- where do you go to church? Do you know the Lord? You know, and if they know the Lord, well, we have something in common. We can begin to have a conversation about that. Or perhaps maybe they uh, are in construction, and I had been in construction before, so I can, I can, I have common ground there. Well, if you're going to walk with someone on a daily basis, that means you're going to have to have a lot in common. And so, when you're talking about the walk that Enoch had with the Lord, 
I think it was a walk of holiness, and I think it was a walk of righteousness. And I, I still think that it was, he was ever, ever present, uh, aware. Let me say that he was ever aware of the presence of God with him and around him and fellowshipping with him on a, on a consistent basis. He was walking in the light, 1 John chapter 1. Verse number five. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So we see that Enoch was walking in the light. The light that God gave him, that's what he walked in. He walked in the life. I, I say another thing is that he, he walked in, uh, with, in a, with a surrendered life, if you would. Let me go to Second John here. I'm just, I'm just kind of giving you some verses for, for reiteration here. Um, but the surrendered life, that means that God, he, he, when they're walking together, it means that God was leading, all right? God was leading in that walk. He was surrendered to the Lord where, whatever direction the Lord had for him, that's the direction that he went. In, uh, in 2 John, verse number 6, it says this, And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. There was a love that, that Enoch had for the Lord. He pleased God. He walked with God. He had a, a walk of faith in the Lord. He was reconciled to him. He was in agreement with God. He had fellowship with him. And it was all because that he had a surrendered life and he followed him. He had communion with him. Now, it says that 300 years he had communion with him. Do you realize that Enoch had basically the same responsibilities as you and I have? Now, he probably didn't have an automobile. He, but he, you know what? He had children. He said he had sons and daughters. He had children. He had all the responsibilities that come with a life of having children. He had all the responsibilities of working. He had all the responsibilities of, of, that could, just comes with life. He was a husband, he was a father, I don't know what else he was, he, some kind of farmer or worker, I, I don't know, we're not told that. But he dealt with the same things, and yet in the same times that he dealt with, in the same things that he had to deal with, and remember Cain, he started a new religion, he even started another city, Remember? He had to deal with some of the same false teachings and some of the same things that we have to deal with. But yet he remained true to the Lord in his walk with the Lord with a walk of faith knowing that God was and he was a seeker of the Lord. He walked with the Lord. But not only that, look, look in, look in uh, Jude for a moment. You can go and look at that. It, 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 there's one verse about him here. There's only one chapter in Jude, but it's verse number 14. Now remember the book of Jude, I think the ladies went through this not very long ago, and it's basically talking about some of these false teachers and some of these apostates, and one of them being Cain. Cain is mentioned here. And then Cain, just after Cain, it is mentioned uh, Enoch here. Look in verse number 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these. Now, when he's saying of these, he's talking about these false teachers, Enoch, uh, Balaam, uh, or, or uh, let me find it here. Well, we don't have to find those. That, he, he was basically battling false teachers. And Enoch also said from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints. All the way back, you know, sometimes we think that these people didn't have all, a lot of light. You understand what I'm saying? We have the complete book uh, uh, of the Lord. We have, we have the complete Bible. But look, even all the way back then, the seventh from Adam, what is he preaching about? He's preaching about the second coming of the Lord. He's talking about the coming with ten thousands of his saints. He's talking about this. And this is the, the seventh generation from the beginning, from Adam. Look what it says here. To, now look, now he's a preacher. Let me read it one more time, and then we're going to continue in verse number 15. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of thee, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints, 
to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust and their mouths speaking great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. How many times did he mention ungodly in that statement? Now, I'm going to tell you, <laughs> He walked with God. And he wasn't scared to call things ungodly. He wasn't scared to call even his own uncles and, his, and their descendants ungodly. And so we see him preaching here. He's preaching again, the second coming. The Lord's coming back and he's going to judge them. And he's talking about sin. He's talking about all those things. So his faith walk, he believed that God was. He was a seeker of the Lord. He walked with the Lord he preached for the Lord. And then also, uh, this last thing, go back to Hebrews, it says that he, his translation. Now, his translation. This word translation just means to, to cross over. This is, most people believe, you know, and if you go back to Genesis, it says that he walked with God and he was no more for God took him. So he's walking along with God one day. They're having such good fellowship that God go ahead and take, bring, takes him home to be with him. Now, why in the world would God do that? Why? You know, there, there's at least one explanation uh, of that. If you go all the way to um, Revelation, you remember the two witnesses in Revelation. Some people disagree with this. I don't know. Uh, and really, this is not one of those things we can be dogmatic about. Uh, but if you go to the two witnesses, um, it, I, it is most certain, I think, that one of them is going to be Elijah. You remember there were two people to ever be, to leave this earth without dying. Remember? And, and one of them was Elijah and one of them was Enoch. And uh, the Bible tells us it's appointed a man wants to die and then the judgment. Well, if they haven't died, uh, it, it, then they have missed their appointment, haven't they? And, uh, and so they think, some people think that that appointment is going to come during the tribulation when God sends those two witnesses back. You can go study that. You can agree with it, disagree with it, whatever. Um, some people think it's going to be Moses and Elijah because of what was seen at the transfiguration of the Lord Jesus Christ. But nevertheless, it's really not that important. That's not something, not a hill I would die on for any means, by any means. But it's an interesting thought, isn't it? Uh, but these are the only two characters that we have in the Bible that, that escape death. And one is Enoch and the other is Elijah. Um, but the one testimony that he had back in Hebrews 11 is that he pleased God. He pleased God. And, and so his walk of faith, it was not that, look, his walk was basically, now look, you and I, let me, let me, you and I have the spirit of the living God living inside of us. You know, Enoch did not have that. The Holy Spirit was not given until uh, at Pentecost in, in Acts chapter number two. The Holy Spirit was not given until then. But you and I, if we're believers and we know Christ is our Savior, the Holy Spirit has come to live inside of us. And we have his presence living inside of us. And I say to you that we can fellowship just as Enoch did. I'm not going to say God's going to take you. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that the walk that he had, the faith walk that he had, everywhere that he went... And I, I tell you, there's times that I live like this, and there's times I don't. You know, when you're making decisions, you say, Lord, what would you have me do here? And, and, and it's a constant daily conversation. You understand what I'm saying? A constant daily conversation with the Lord. Lord, what would you have me do here? Lord, what, where, where do we need to eat? Lord, what, 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 do you want, what do you want for this day? Who do I need to talk to? Lord, would you guide this conversation? God, would you, uh, who do I need to contact today? Um, and so there, there's, there's, there can be that, that fellowship, that constant awareness that God is there and God is with you. And you know, there's times when, and I'm not saying he's he going to speak to you audibly, but he can lead you and he can guide you. He can help you. He's our teacher. And I say to you that our faith walk, we can have the same faith walk that Enoch had. Can you imagine walking with God for 300 years? <laughs> That's what the Bible says. He walked with God for 300 years. Now, believe it or not, if you go and study these old, these, in this lineage here, he, he didn't, that was not a long time. His, his son, Methuselah, 969 years old before he died. Adam, and, and, you know, if you study this, Adam, I, I haven't, I haven't done the math and I, it just came to my mind. Adam possibly could have still been alive 
at this particular time. Because Adam lived a pretty good while. Several hundred years, many hundred years. While he was preaching and while he was ministering. And, uh, but anyway, that walk that, that Enoch had, it was a faith walk. And again, he is introducing that, look, to these Jewish, these Jewish people that are entrenched in Judaism. They're saying, hey, it's never been about rituals. It's never been about re- uh, 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 religion. It's never been about just being your nationality, just being a Jew. It's never been about any of that. It's always been, if we're going to draw nigh to God and we're going to have a walk with God, it's always going to have to be by faith, believing that he is, being a seeker of him, walking with him. And by the way, this is sequential, preaching for him and then translating. That, that, that should be the story of all of our lives. We come to know that God is, and then we become a seeker of the Lord. We are transformed by his uh, saving grace, but through faith, we begin to walk with him. And if we're truly walking with him, what should we be doing? I'm not saying preaching like I'm doing, but sharing. Standing up in our generation, declaring truth. Standing up for what is right. And then we all know at the end of, at the end of our lives what's going to happen. We're all going to, this is an early picture also of the, of the rapture. The translation, early picture of the rapture. You know, this is another way that we, you and I it could go out at any moment. Uh, the rapture, the rapture taking place, the Lord trumpet, trumpet sound, the, the shout of the archangel, all those things, and we could be out of here. But uh, anyway, a picture of what a Christian ought to live and a picture of the walk that we ought to have, and, uh, and it's all by faith, living by faith, the walk of faith, believing that God is, preaching for him, searching him, walking with him, all those things, and I hope that our lives reflect this. If not, we need to adjust like he did. If, how can two walk together except they be agreed? We need to agree with God. Agree with God about life and about sin and agree with, agree with him so that we can walk with him as we should. And I hope that your walk is a steady walk with the Lord, ever reminded of his presence in your life. Do you talk with him all the time? Do you pray with him? Do you sing to him? That's the way God intended for it to be. He enjoys fellowship with us. Do you realize that? Isn't it an amazing thing that he enjoys fellowship with his people? That the God of heaven would want to hear from us and him speak to us and we have communion with each other. But that has been made possible because of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in this new covenant. And we can walk with God by faith because He is, and because we can seek him and be found, and he can be found, and because we can walk with him. And because of all that, we ought to be preaching and teaching for him all over. Well, let's bow for a word of prayer, all right? Father, we again are so grateful for your mercy and your love that you've given to us. We're thankful that we can walk with you. Lord, that we can pray with you. You you want to hear us. You, You know every step we take. And Lord, I pray that we'd be aware of it. And, Lord, I think if we were aware of your presence, Lord, I think it would change our lifestyles. It would change the way we look and the way we see, the way we hear. And, Lord, I pray you'd do a work in our hearts and lives in this manner. Thank you again for loving us, being good to us. Lord, I pray for every prayer request that was mentioned. Lord, these that are close to death. And, Lord, I pray that you would grant your grace to these families. And uh, may your grace be known to them in a very special and real way. And, Lord, these ones that are facing surgeries, and, Lord, I pray that you would have a calm and about them and letting them know that you are in control and we're in your hands. And, Lord, I pray that you give doctors wisdom and understanding as they're attending to all of these and all these who are sick among us. Thank you again for loving us and being good to us. In Jesus' name, amen.